Hey everybody, it's Corey from Aquarium Co-op. Got Lamont in studio with me tonight, and uh, it's Real Fish Talk, episode number eight. So, the question we're gonna address first is how to sterilize aquarium equipment. It's shown up in people asking us how to sterilize nets, uh, how do I sterilize a tank, how do I sterilize my siphon that I'm using between tanks, all those things. So we're gonna lump all of those questions into one, so that's why there's no uh, little white box above us saying who asked the question because a bunch of people have asked it so we figure if multiple people ask multiple people want to hear it and so we aim to please three people this video <laughs> uh, so let's start with uh, you know so one that's come up a couple times is nets how do we how, how do you like to sterilize nets, or what's at least one way, and we'll keep firing off ways until we've run out of things to talk about. Sure. Uh, so, you go first. Well, I think probably the tried and true method is just to let the nets dry out in between each use, but um, which of course requires more than one net. But mm -hmm. uh, so there's also the salt method, um, we have a, a maximum dilution, is that what they call that, where essentially it just... Yeah, I think it's, uh, what is it, S super saturation or sure. something like that. Basically where you put so much salt in a container with water that salt can't dissolve in anymore, which is a lot of salt. So, you know, your container you'd want a nice layer of salt sitting down there that won't dissolve, mm -hmm. and then you know it's crazy salty. Um, but I will bring up like, I hate that method and that's because your net is then covered in salt and one, you get a little bit of salt in the tanks. So that's actually mostly beneficial for most tanks, that type of thing. So I'm not worried about that. But if you drip, you know, a drip on the floor or the front of the tank, you then have a salt water deposit, just like on a salt water tank. And, uh, that sucks. And then if you have a cut on your hand, and you go to grab a net, <laughs> it really stings. So that's that's, that's another thing that's not good. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, it does sterilize pretty decently because, uh, unfortunately, I know from experience, I've had a, a fish stuck in the net, and you know, you, as you're putting the net in to sterilize it, the fish drops in, and literally before I can fish it back out, the fish is dead. So it literally kill the fish in you know five to seven seconds, and that's. That's how you know how potent it is. You know, that being said, I'm sure there are illnesses or bacteria or whatever that probably are immune to that at this point, you know, because I think any method we mention is not foolproof because it's being used somewhere in the world at a fish farm and then immunities are being built up to it. So, yeah. Um, what else you got? You got any other ideas for, for net usage? Um, uh, well, I'm sure there's probably some chemical type solutions that you can use that are safe. And then, um, I mean, is there like a vinegar solution that you can use that'll work the same as salt or? Well, yeah. So vinegar, um, will sterilize or kill some things. It'll be very acidic and that'll work on a selection of things, but you know, the reality is we'll never know what it works on. You might say, okay, it kills this bacteria, but it doesn't kill that bacteria, or it kills ick cysts, but it won't kill ink or worms, or I don't think any one thing's going to do it all. And you could, you know, probably if you really want to be good at it, you would say, all right, we wash the net in chlorine and hot water, then we dip it in <laughs> uh, salt, then we run it through the vinegar bath, and then we put it through ultraviolet sterilization, and then you realize you still had the illness on your hand or something as you go to catch in the next tank. But um, yeah, and there's also, uh, for chemicals, you know, there's gonna be a few, like bleach. Bleach would be the most common one that people on the YouTube channel have recommended and say they like to use. Why I don't like it is uh, it tends to break the nets down. So like at the store for us, we'll have, you know, a bucket with nets in it. And if there's bleach solution in there, uh, after, let's say, a month or six weeks, those nets are just, you can just pull the metal right out of them and the net stays because it just it's hard on the net. And then also, depending on how big the, the concentration or how much the concentration is, you can get, uh, you know, bleach stains on your shirt, which I think even this 
<laughs> this one I actually don't have bleach on, but they're because I do use bleach at the shop to stare to uh, clean micron filters and stuff. Uh, I have gotten bleach on myself, and that's that's another thing. You're ruining your clothes just to uh, you know sterilize nets, and then also you know depending on how small of a tank you know if we were using a net and we put it into a two and a half gallon that could maybe be enough chlorine to actually do some damage or bleach to do damage so but usually in larger tanks not an issue um, but that being said you know don't do as I'm saying go ahead and wash it and all that and dechlorinate it and things like that um, another chemical I know of that people like to use would be uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna murder this probably and everyone's gonna laugh at me but potassium permanganate or PP uh, it's used for you know dosing ponds or even fish tanks and in general, it oxidizes uh, organic material, which that's just fancy words for everything. Bacteria, uh, fish gills, uh, you know, fish lice, anything. It's gonna basically start oxidizing it. The water turns purple and, you know, it also, you know, using the correct amounts isn't that harmful, but it also stains the hell out of the floor and your hands and things like that. So, you know, with, you get the fact that, oh, it doesn't break the net, it does sterilize a lot of stuff, but it's literally like dragging purple dye around the entire room. And if you've ever been to a wholesaler that's using it, you can see everywhere a net's ever been because there's just drip marks everywhere that's permanently stained concrete and stuff like that, or the wood. Um, and I know there's other net soaks you can buy and these are the ones that I generally really don't like and the reason being uh, like Jungle makes one or at least a new company is making I think uh, Aquatic Eco sources it somewhere and sells it now and uh, there's some other ones too those are the ones that are being used at um, wholesalers and because they're so used the logic would be that Anything that's making it through that fish room is going to be immune to it. So if it makes it from my wholesaler to me, and I'm counting on my net soak to uh, kill that thing so I don't transfer to the next tank, clearly if it's already making it through there, it's probably already immune to it or at least highly resistant to it. And that's just, you know, so then it's not doing what I need to do. Um, Essentially you're creating stronger diseases right yeah and that's things. you know and that that argument can be made for anything bleach you know potassium permanganate you know even you know in theory we might be able to let a net air dry but it only net you know it only dried for 11 minutes and it only mostly dried out and then that strain mutates a little bit and develops that I mean that's an extreme case that highly unlikely but you know in a situation where you on average took 11 minutes to catch fish out of a tank or something and it was happening month after month after month at a fish farm or a, a wholesaler that could actually happen unlikely at home for you um, I would say you know at home if you have 10 tanks or less something like that it probably makes sense just have a net for each tank mm -hmm. um, nets aren't that expensive not for the amount of fish you're playing with and some wholesalers will do that or even some fish stores will have a net dedicated to each tank and there's no cross contamination between the tanks that being said you could still cross contaminate from fish are sick in the tank net sits on the outside air dries new fish come into the store into that tank net goes back in contaminates the tank but you know that's there's no way to be 100 percent safe we can only you know get as much as we reasonably can so get rid of the easy stuff yeah take out take you know reasonable precautions and uh you know it's that's all you can do really uh, i'm trying to think if i can think of any other ways to sterilize a net um you know i suppose i've, I've never done it but i suppose you could either boil the net or steam it you know i don't really have <laughs> you know, I know my wife would go, you know, go insane if I'm putting fish nets in a boiling pot or something, but I suppose that would work just fine, or if you had really, really hot water, it would probably kill most things as well. Um, but I don't have that access. I don't even have warm water in my fish room, so besides a fish tank. Um, yeah, so our preferred method at the store, what are we currently using? Basically just the 
rinse in hot water or let it dry overnight. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I would say the way we could improve ours is just having more nets. If you know a busy Saturday, there's less dry time than you know Monday morning, where there's you know could be a lot of time between customers, something like that. But you end up hitting a point where how many nets is enough? The answer is well, you never have enough. And we do we do set it right next to the dehumidifier, so they do dry really quick. But even that being said, it's not not a perfect system, um, but it's pretty good. I mean, I'm not even sure most is getting through the chlorine and hot water, you know. So I don't even know if the drying is essential, but I know it doesn't hurt. So um, yeah, so that's the system we we used to use salt and. I couldn't take it anymore. Paying employees to rub salt off of <laughs> sand and the car, or uh, not sand, but the, the stands, the carpet, the fronts of the tanks. It gets everywhere. And, you know, the worst part is we're not even a saltwater store. We only sell fresh water. So it's like, oh, it's really a beating. Uh, so that's why we do the other method now. And honestly, I think it works just as good. I haven't noticed any more or less disease or anything. It's the same. Uh, not that there's that much anyway, but um, you know, it seems equal at this point. And I think most of these methods we've mentioned are probably all about equal. Someone could make an argument that one is better for one thing, you know, one particular illness than another. But that being said, you could make the argument, well, maybe I'll never run into that illness. So, yeah, I would say whatever you can implement easy into your routine is probably what you should be doing. I would say at the bare minimum, uh, either letting the net dry out or rinsing it be going between two tanks would be the bare minimum at least being uh cognitive of the fact that this net or whatever going between two tanks is potential um to you know spread disease or or you know sometimes and i, I guess we should touch on this it's not even a disease i'm worried about spreading but in my own fish room uh it could be a guppy fry or uh, a shrimp if i use one net in one guppy tank and then I'm using that net in another guppy tank. If I take, you know, uh, a black Moscow fry and it lands in my red delta fry, if I don't notice it and it grows up and it breeds before I notice, I've ruined my whole tank and I'd have to start over. So, you know, same thing with shrimp and that you get a male yellow shrimp that hops into an orange shrimp tank. You wouldn't even see that thing for a long time and then you're just you're sad so not only <laughs> are we worried about diseases we could be worried about fish and uh you know snails too some people you know hate snails they don't want to move them from tank to tank that type of thing or, <laughs> don't or yeah i was gonna say or heaven forbid <laughs> the worst thing the thing that we're afraid of the most that would be duckweed because once it's there it's a lot of work and I'll tell you what, the day someone comes up with a little additive I can put into the water that kills duckweed and doesn't harm fish or anything else, that is a product <laughs> I want to invest in. I'm investing all the money I have into that stock. So uh, that's actually what I fear the most is duckweed. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's one, you can have a dried up speck and it can get in a tank, rehydrate and start multiplying. Yep. And then speaking of salt water dips, you know, I've seen the duckweed survive in that as well. <laughs> yeah, that, that infuriated me. <laughs> so, you know, salt so high it can kill a fish in seven seconds and yet duckweed's reproducing in the bucket and there's not even a light on the bucket. Like it's maddening that it's that resilient. But that's why it's kind of a noxious weed and invasive in lots of states and things like that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's great and horrible. You know, if you're raising goldfish, best thing ever invented if you're keeping a planet tank your worst nightmare so uh yeah but let's say we need to sterilize other things for the aquarium uh you know things kind of change let's say uh let's see here. let's say we had some horrible illness in a tank you know in the fish room and yeah so the other one people want to know about uh their siphon you know because let's say we we tell you own 10 10 nets, but you can't really own, well, you can own 10 siphons, but I don't think you can afford 10 siphons or don't want to afford 10 siphons. Um, if you were having a problem at home, how would you, how would you do it? Well, I would say if you have a tank that, um, you know, there's an illness or there's a, a or you're treating for a disease or, or something like that, I would say, do the water change on that tank last? 
Yep, that's what we do at the store too a lot of times is if we're uh, cleaning filters or something like that, you know, known illness tanks are always last. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm trying to think if I needed to sterilize uh, a hose or something, I'd probably run hot water through it. Mm -hmm. I feel like that would help, whether that would kill necessarily the bacteria or anything. You can't be sure, but I feel like it would help. It would. I would sleep better at night. Um, potassium permanganate, you could definitely do that. That that being said, that stuff that stuff's wicked. You know, you, you don't really just want to be playing with that stuff. But that would do it. Uh, I think bleach would do it. Um, you know, you'd want to rinse it really well after the bleach. The potassium permanganate it basically oxidizes itself off and quick rinse probably. But. Um, you know that besides air drying you know but usually if you're like me it's you know today's the day I'm working on the fish tanks and uh, so I either have to do that last or if you know sometimes you just you find the illness while you're cleaning and then you're like oh crap well I got four more tanks to do and you know the other alternative would be I guess if you had two siphons you could have you know the backup you know oh crap siphon <laughs> it's like <laughs> Good thing I had a backup because that one's got to be put off to the side because it's contaminated now. Um, you know, and while we're on the topic of siphons, a lot of people ask us in the store, like, how do they clean their siphon when it when their black stuff gets in there? And what that is is usually either a fungus or a mold mm -hmm. or an algae, and it's just because we put water through it that's got mold, fish poop, and nitrogen and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and then it sits somewhere there's a little bit of light, and over time it grows some crap in there. And yeah, we have had people run bleach or very hot water through it and things like that, and uh, it will clean it up, but I would say it's mostly an eyesore. It doesn't really, uh, or in my experience, hasn't affected any of my tanks. Like, it's not spreading algae or anything like that, so. Um, but which brings up a point. With the, the siphon, uh, not spreading duckweed is probably the biggest thing I'm trying not to do with the <laughs> siphon, and so... Once again, like almost all those things I said won't do anything for duckweed, so probably just really rinsing well. I'm trying to think of what else we do to avoid that. Maybe uh, save the goldfish tanks for last, so that way the goldfish will eat the duckweed. I'm trying to think, but yeah. I, that's the only way I can think of to sterilize it reliably. I mean, you could have a saturated salt solution, I suppose, you know, but it's going to take like a bucket, not a, not even a bucket, like a, a trash can full to do, you know, a 50-foot siphon or something like that. Sure. So I don't think that's really practical, but... Well, at home I have a siphon that I use to take the water out, and then I have a siphon that I use to pump clean water back in. Yeah, and so, that's... So see, that's something I, I don't do, yeah. So I think even at that level... You're reducing um, as far as like flushing water through the same stretch of hose when mm -hmm. you had dirty water or possibly contaminated water, and you're pumping clean water back. If you have one that you just designate for removing waste and one for putting in fresh water, that might help reduce the risk as well. But no, I think that definitely is because you know I forget I've been in the hobby a while now, and you know I. I automate so much stuff, but we we do that at the store. I didn't even realize that, you know, without bringing that up is, you know, we have lines to fill tanks, which mm -hmm. we automatically water change four times a day. But let's say we need to do maintenance on a specific tank. We have a hose that comes out for only filling water. And then we have, you know, ones that we use for only siphoning water. And, you know, honestly, in my mind, we're doing that because it saves time. You know, but yes, you're completely right in the fact that it will limit risk more also. Mm -hmm. You know, I think uh, if you limit, you know, the amount of exposure on the actual hose to the water, you know, would help. You know, keep things only leaving. It's got to be better than, well, let's put some of that back in too, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, then... Let's see, if we need to sterilize an actual aquarium, like let's say you had angel aids or something like that, like something just terrible, like there's there's no known stopping that besides sterilization. Um, how would you go about that? I, I know I've got, and that's this is assuming all fish have died or something like, you know, this is catastrophic, oh my God, need to make sure this never happens again scenario. Well, I guess it would, you know, if it's something that horrible, I would say, well, what size is the tank? And would it just be easier just to buy a brand new one? 
So I would hmm. say if it's like 55 gallons or under, which is relatively affordable, I'd say just scrap it. And use it like, it. yeah, you could use it as, you know, a terrarium or something like that. But yeah, I've got, I've got a, I guess a series of events that, you know, the, <laughs> oh my God, horrible things have happened. And for me, what that is, is, so let's say I've got a tank and it could have plants. I mean, at the point that I, I have to go, I can't put anything else in this tank till I do something about it. I, I'm writing everything off. Sure. And uh, so that might mean uh, super salt saturation, which means I go to Home Depot or Lowe's and I buy rock salt and I literally just pour, you know, depending on size of the tank, but maybe it's like a pound per gallon. Like there's an insane amount of salt in there. That's going to be sterilizing. Mm -hmm. I crank that heater. You know, I literally want it like 100 degrees in there and I'll let that sit for a week or something like that. And then I'll go ahead and kind of drain that water out and then I might even throw the gravel away and then really rinse and 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 let that dry and then do it again and then if you know you know we're in the we're in Washington so we never get it but if you had sunlight where you live you put it in the sunlight the UV rays will actually break some stuff down too and you know there's some other things potassium permanganate I don't play with that stuff but you could but I haven't found, you know, knock on wood, uh, nothing that has been horrible that I needed to get rid of has ever made it through that so far. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm hoping that never happens because I don't, I don't know what else I'm going to do by the time it makes it through 100 degree heat and, you know, infinite salt and being air dried and being exposed to the sun. Like at that point, it's probably an alien and it's going to kill me, but. Sure. <laughs> but yeah, that's my you know, completely reset. I want to kill everything good and everything bad in there. And, uh, you know, that means all the fish have died because really you, you don't do that method and like, oh, well, I'll save the fish. Like you're just moving that somewhere is all you're doing. Sure. Um, so yeah, sterilization. I'm trying to think of what else do we need to sterilize in an aquarium um, that we're moving around? Well, what about uh, filtration? I mean, say if you're, I don't know, I mean, in an instant where you're like, oh, I use this hang on back on another tank, mm -hmm. and then and now I'm going to switch it over to this one because I want to Yeah, and I can think of another start a brand new tank, or I want to say one of them broke and your only backup was on another tank. I mean, yep, I was going to say the other thing I could think of is where you'd use a filter somewhere else would be... Um, setting up a, a quarantine tank or something like that where you've got extra filters on a tank and you kind of split it off. Mm -hmm. You know, my my thinking is, you know, if you're posing the question, all right, how do you sterilize filtration? Well, look, it comes as a two-part problem to me is one, if I sterilize, I lose all the bacteria. So that's like, okay, well, I probably want the bacteria. So then my next logical thing is, well, how do I keep the bacteria alive but not take things I don't want. And my guess would be what I would do is I would probably move the filter to a new tank. Well, not necessarily new, but a different tank. Hmm. And I would allow no life to be in there besides just the bacteria. I'd lose some of the bacteria, but maybe I could dose, um, maybe I could bring some fish poop over or put some food in so it could digest it. But in theory, most parasites and things like that will die off without a host after X amount of time. Now, part of the problem is some of that stuff could be like, oh yeah, it's got three weeks or four weeks or, you know, very right. long gestation times. But most things, it's 10 days, 14 days or under. And so if I had that much lead time, that's probably how I would sterilize it without, you know, literally sterilizing it. Sure. If I needed to use it. You know, um, kind of just essentially waiting out. The yeah, it's cycle. Yeah, and you you can do that. I, sh I guess I should mention that you can do that with an aquarium as well. Um, for some things, you know, like at the point where I have angel aids or koi aids or you know something horribly uncurable, I don't want to tempt fate. But uh, you know, let's say you just had a case of anchor worm that you literally couldn't get on top of. It took down all the fish, which that'd be an extreme scenario. But after two or three weeks, the anchor worms all have hatched out. They couldn't find hosts. They'll starve to death. And that's one way that, you know, you're sterilizing it, you know, which 
really in that instance we're using getting rid of anchor worm because it's not sterilizing it because it's not sterile but it will take that organism and it will die off um yeah i'm trying to think and if i needed to actually sterilize a filter all the media well i won't, I won't say all the media but bio rings i boil you know that's a good way to clean them and sterilize them mm -hmm. um let's say bio balls sponge filters um, all of those, maybe I would use vinegar or bleach. Well, and salt. I'd probably do vinegar and salt and things like that. I like things that, you know, when I dilute them back out, they're relatively harmless. Right. And I'm, I'm always afraid of bleach because it doesn't take very much bleach to really wreak some havoc. Well, I just, my eyes turn red and I start sneezing when I'm around bleach, so <laughs> I try to avoid it. That's why I get all the bleach stains because he doesn't like to work with it, so, you know, it's... <laughs> You gotta do what you gotta do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't expect you to work with it if it, you know, you react. Well, to it. I, you know, I, I learned it the hard way. It wasn't like, sure. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh man, that's uh, this is not pleasant. But I don't know. I guess how I feel about you know sterilizing this net or sterilizing, you know, I mean. If you know that it's a bad situation or you know that you have a horrible disease, that's one thing. And or you know, there's always that slim percentage that you're gonna get something like that. But I think in most cases you're just gonna have to assume that that stuff's already in there. You know what I mean? Like by the time you've I mean even in a very strict quarantine environment, say in like a fish room, I mean it's some point it's safe to say that you've accidentally got your fingers in this tank or that tank and mm -hmm. over time you just kind of have to assume that well it's everywhere at this point because there's just no 100 percent sure way to get rid of yeah there's a lot of or contain a disease in a specific spot in, in most you know practical ways for most people yeah there's a lot of discus people that will deworm their discus every six months mm -hmm. out of the fact of we really don't want worms you know and it's you would think okay i haven't introduced anything and it's been six months and i don't see them but they still do it because they find that over time and let's say that's over a three-year period they they got you know internal tapeworms twice even though really there should be no way it was ever introduced whether it's frozen food live food that type of thing but you know it goes to show that no matter how careful you are you know, you're still not 100%. Even if you used every type of sterilization method we just mentioned, there's still some virus or bacteria or parasite that lives through all that. Or, you know, and, and by one of those things, the worst thing you can imagine, duckweed will literally live through like all that, I swear. I haven't tried <laughs> boiling it yet, but I have a feeling it would shrug it off just because that's Well, what I'm sure does. if you boil it, it's got to just taste delicious. Yeah. So. <laughs> Oh God, if I eat duckweed, you know, it's... <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's see, I, I want to see... Yeah, and that was the last thing is... So we've talked about how to sterilize everything, you know, or at least most pieces of equipment, heaters, you could do that for all of that kind of stuff. But at the end, if you're not sterilizing your hands and the things, or like, let's say like at work, I've got a towel in my back pocket, those types of things, mm -hmm. you know, that... What you brought up is that accidental contamination. It's really, really, really hard not to accidentally contaminate stuff. And right. So you try to just limit it. Right. So say like, you know, you you brought home some new fish, and and you know, obviously you're supposed to quarantine them first. But let's say that you know the fish were quarantined in advance, and you just go ahead and introduce with what you have. You know, I would say maybe, you know, working on that tank, save it for last, or say even feeding or something like that, save that tank for last, and then, you know, that'll at least, in theory, give you a stretch of time to monitor before I think you would just assume inevitably right. diseases are getting spread back to And I've, I've actually been to some, uh, I guess seminars or schooling, whatever you want to call it, on biosecurity. And that's what they call what we're talking about here, except no one's ever going to type into YouTube. Well, I won't say <laughs> no one, but a hobbyist isn't going to say, you know, like, oh, how can I up my biosecurity 
on my fish tank, but that's what they, when you attend a, uh, a speaker for wholesalers or fish farms and things like that, it's always a very big topic is biosecurity. And that's what we've just been talking about with less fancy words. But mm. they maintain that even now, you know, we've known all these things for many, many years that with biosecurity, you need to have a barrier between every tank. So if I was a tank and Lamont's a tank, there'd be this big plastic sheet that goes two feet to 30 inches tall and 12 inches out from the edge of the tank and behind it because they've proven that if you set a sponge filter or an air stone or something like that and you've got two tanks right next to each other that they can literally make bacteria hop over and parasites just from, oh, they wanted water droplet. And, uh, or, you know, classic one, feed some African cichlids, the food, splash, there it goes over, you know, Oscar knocked over a bunch of water to the other tank. You know, so there's that. And then, you know, when you go and visit these facilities, and I've been to, I think only one I've actually been to, but uh, they literally make you soak your feet before you can even walk in the building. Yep. Like you've got the foot soak where it literally shoes go in, you have to stay there for 20 seconds, then you walk through. The next step, you have to wash your hands, even though you're not even allowed to touch anything. Mm -hmm. You have to wash it so that if you were to trip and touch something, you wouldn't quarantine that way. And uh, so, yeah, that's biosecurity. It's all the rage in the aquaculture and fish farming and things like that. And it leads to the next video, which we're not going to shoot right now, but why fish are so weak. We literally have made it to where almost a fish will never see a disease while we're creating or building or breeding this fish. Mm -hmm. And that's why when it lands in your fish tank or the fish store or the pet smart or the pet co where there is some disease somewhere, it just, it's a magnet for it. You know, it's never seen it before. If you, you know, if you've lived in the jungle and you've never seen you know, a cold before. The minute you get on a plane, you're going to have 15 <laughs> different strains, mm -hmm. you know. So, but yeah, that's biosecurity. You're never going to need to know that term again unless you're getting into fish farming or something like that. Uh, but if you did want to look into that, and you can, you know, one of my favorite things to nerd out on is typing words like that into Google, biosecurity manual, biosecurity article, that type of thing. And you can get doctorate research papers and things like that. And you can read about these tests and things and you know if you wanted to up your game in your fish room or something like that you totally could and you can read the statistics and what are the odds that you know how many days did it take before bacteria finally jumped and if if they run that study and it oh yeah within you know a month it has jumped every single time well guess what in your fish room every month it's spreading and so you can almost watch it go oh yeah Bacterial infection here went to here. A month later, it was here. A month here, it was later. You mm -hmm. know, and so you step in. So, uh, I think that answers the question on how to sterilize nets, uh, hoses, and equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's lots of different ways you can do it. I would say the best method is the one that you can actually implement. Whether that's buying some extra supplies, you've got access to one of the chemicals, or you've got a great sink right next to your fish room, or You've got that bucket of salt water because you also keep salt water tanks and you could make it extra salty or, you know, use what's available to you. There's no one best method, maybe combining a couple of methods and just realizing that you're just trying to reduce risk. You can't eliminate risk. Mm -hmm. So, and then also, you know, making sure that the fish... I mean, the, the health of the fish is going to dictate a lot, too, I think, as far as whether diseases are going to crop up. So it's mm -hmm. like what you're saying is, you know, fish that you know, they've been bred or, or, you know, raised isolated from other potential diseases. And so when you mix, you know, one group of cardinal tetras in with a, an established group of cardinals, I mean, you still run the risk of like, well, it's gone through quarantine. Those fish look fine. Um, and then you mix them together and then like all of a sudden the plague breaks out because one group of cardinals has something that the other one doesn't have a resistance to yet. Yep, so. yep, and that's that's another episode on why we want to introduce koi to a quarantine pond and we want known koi that have been in our koi pond with those koi and that would be the best way. We don't do that in aquariums, but we should be. You should be going, oh, I should bring you know, three cardinal tetras from the main tank and put them into quarantine with the other cardinal tetras and observe them for a month or two and then bring them over. But that's, 
you know, we're just we're just not willing to do it as Aquarius most times. But that's what they'd be doing in a breeding facility and things like that as well. Right. Just because they can't chance, you can't chance. Like, well, there went you know three point seven million dollars in angelfish or guppies or whatever it is. You can't take that chance. And so, uh, you know, in biosecurity, I actually bought a. Uh, the guppy breeding manual from a guy that breeds in uh, Israel and things like that and he helps build fish farms and his biosecurity for a quarantine is literally a different building he likes to take a um, a shipping container and turn it into the quarantine facility and so you have to sterilize yourself going in and sterilize yourself coming out and everything that all the equipment that's in there never leave so right. that would be nets that'd be siphons that would be food that would be literally nothing's allowed to come out until it's gone through its quarantine period mm -hmm. and then once that is they sterilize the entire facility and they would bring in a new strain of fish to introduce to the farm and uh you know that's just how serious they take it and how serious you could take it but you need to decide what level you want to take it and i i take it at the level of well yeah i'll rinse a net and i'll hang it up to dry so yeah, I would say that if you're buying fish from a store that doesn't do any quarantining, if that's a word, quarantining, sure, <laughs> sure, at all, it doesn't. It's not even really going to matter at a certain point whether you're because you could be bringing anything in at that point. So because mm -hmm. none of those fish have, or I mean, maybe at some point they've seen medication, but it's hard to say what and when and where and. Uh, whether it's going to do you any good or not. So, yeah. Anything else? I think that's it for <laughs> for that one. Basically, we're all doomed. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, that's you know, I I won't even guarantee that the fish I own are healthy because to really guarantee that you need to be putting stuff under a microscope right. and even though you cure the ick. It most times is reoccurring and it was already in the gills of a fish or something like that so it's being carried through tanks and things like that and it only expresses itself when the opportunity arises so you know that's yeah so, <laughs> whole nother rabbit hole to go down which we're not going to go down in this episode so so you've just watched episode number eight yeah, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time We'll see you next week.